All right, this morning we're going to jump right into uh, continuing our sermon series. We have this idea of burning the ships, or as you again know, uh, comes from the legend of Herman Cortex when he landed on the, board, on the, uh, the coast of Mexico, and he told his people to go on land, and he had them scuttle the ships and burn them. And I say this every time, but I'll repeat it again. The the concept behind that, or the reason he had him do it, was to make sure there's no turning back. Uh, To make sure that any kind of string attached, or the concept of returning from where they came, or here's another one for us to think about, the comfort of not being in the conflict of moving on, to make sure that was dismissed and unattached. In other words, they, were, they would be very intent at that point on pushing forward. Now, I believe, that, uh, I believe that's many of our problems this morning. So this morning, I, I, I know I do this some Sunday mornings, but maybe this morning you'll have to give me extra grace because I might just speak sort of freely. I'm speaking to myself this morning. But see, I believe that Jesus has a very intense plan for every single one of us. I believe for each of us here this morning, there's a specific reason why you're here. Not only here in God's earth, not only in Holmes County or wherever you live, or not only here in this building, but specifically for the journey you are in right now. There's a specific reason for that. I believe he has a calling for you. He has a very specific calling for you and your life. Now, we know that Peter explains this, right? And Peter, the disciple of Jesus, that a lot of us sort of covet and sort of wish that we could be like him. Not the bad things, but the good things. Uh, But Peter explains this when he writes his letter in the New Testament. He says, you are called out. You have a purpose. You're different. But I believe that's to all of us. So if Jesus has this intense calling for us, you know, we we think Jesus has a place for us to go. And and we say we want to. You know, I think most of us here this morning, our hearts cry is, well, God, where you take me? And and Jesus, where you lead? And I know some of you youth are contemplating the trip to Africa. And and numerous ones of us are thinking of some kind of big thing that we think maybe this is a step we should take. And we should go. And and our hearts cry is that that we want to follow God. And we, we say the right things and we even pray the right prayers a lot of times. But I believe that we have strings attached to us that we're afraid to cut. We're afraid to sever. And I believe we have our ships at Safe Bay waiting there just in case we need them to go back to. And we can't quite let go. And mentally, we are not quite all in with Jesus Christ. Now, I'll explain this as we go on. But I believe we hold back. I believe we have reservations. Last Sunday, we looked at the words of Jesus, if you remember, in Matthew chapter 19. Uh, we read Matthew chapter 19, 16 through 29. I'm sorry, 16 through 28. And where the story was of the man that came to Jesus, remember this young, sort of smarty, schooled, scholar, educated man came to Jesus and he said, you know, what do I need to do to be part of your kingdom and to be part of your team and like... You know, to be part of the elite that's with you. And, and Jesus said, well, dude, you're educated. You know what it takes. Like, obey the law, right? Do what God wants you to do. And he's like, well, all of this I do. And then Jesus said these crazy words that just made him walk away. He said, well, all right. All you have left then is to sell everything you have, give it away, and follow me. Remember that? We talked about it last Sunday. Then in Matthew chapter 19, verse 28 and 29, these are the words Jesus said. If you remember, in following up that conversation, Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has listened to this, and we looked at it last Sunday, but a little bit of repeat, refresher, you know they say that, we have to constantly be reminded and told things like five times to remember it. So this is only the second time. Next Sunday you may have to hear this again. But anyway, so then Jesus said, uh, anyone who has left houses or our belongings, right, the things that are close to us, or brothers or sisters, or father or mother, or wife or children, or fields, and I'll explain that rundown we did last Sunday in a minute, for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. In contrast to where if we don't give that up, the argument could be made we will then not 
inherit eternal life. And last Sunday, we likened this, and I had these questions then for you, that if that's truly the case, if those strings are attached to us that Jesus said need to be severed, they could break down something like this. Number one, your belongings. In other words, your houses, he says. If you aren't willing to let go of your houses, your, your belongings, your cars, your bank account, everything materialistic that means a lot to you. I'm not saying you have to throw it all away. But I'm saying if you keep that attached, it's a problem. Number two was your influence from those closest to you. In other words, likening where Jesus said your brothers and sisters. The ones that we have this sort of influence, we have this, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when I grew up, like there was this crazy little chemistry between my brothers and sisters of trying to outdo each other and some competition. And like the, you cared about your reputation with your siblings, right? Maybe not as much so now that we're older, but when you grow up, that's, that's, that's a big deal. So Jesus said, if you're not willing to give that up, a connection, or grafted relationships, your father and your mother. So those things are good, and they're ble- we, we have strong blessings of parents and relationships with, with family members. But Jesus says, if that's more important, we have a problem. That was the third one. Number four was potential with our children. Remember, he said, if you're not willing to give up your children. So we all have dreams and ideas, and we want to be around to walk our daughter down the aisle, and we want to be here to see our kids grow. And, and we, we think of the potential and the, the dreams of ahead with our kids. I know I see that. Like, I'm excited to see my kids grow older. It's a little scary because that means I'm getting younger, right? But anyway, like, so, so Jesus said, if you're not willing to give up those potentials, those dreams for my sake, I'm not saying you have to throw them out. But if you're not willing to detach that thing that's holding you back, or the last one was fields, which we liken to accumulated uh, additional accumulation, right? Because fields had the potential to get you more in that culture. So the point was, these questions, if you're not willing to sever the attachments of all of these five items in your life, Jesus says, you may not inherit eternal life, Right? All right, so in keeping up with that this morning, with this idea of pursuing Jesus to the fullest extent, or or pursuing the quest of finding strings attached, because I really believe, I look at my own life, and I hope all of you are with me, because somewhere I believe in my life, I have numerous strings attached that I get blinded to. And I would dare say that you may have a few as well. So, in pursuing this quest of finding them, Finding these strings attached and and those things that cripple us, those things that make us lame. See, the problem is, is if you have something that gives you a limp, right? Uh, So you all have seen my daughter. She had surgery with her ACL and all of this, and she's out there so I can talk about her. But anyway, you know, so she has this limp and she has a brace. Well, she had surgery, so she got it fixed. But you and I sometimes, if we have a limp and we have something bothering us, what happens if we let it go? What happens if we wouldn't fix it? What happens if we wouldn't have surgery? What happens if we wouldn't change it? Well, that limp would become permanent, right? We would then develop a handicap to where the rest of our lives, now we have a problem. And that's just us from this point on. Here's the problem is you and I do that with these strings attached. Because we have these things that make us lame in our journey for Jesus, and they give us sort of a limp, and we're not full out running, you know, we're sort of holding back, we're attached. But we're okay to live with that. And, you know, it's just, well, you know, this is my lot, and, and Jesus understands, he gives me grace. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, but we're just willing to be in that lifestyle, and the problem is we get used to it, and we allow it to continue, and now it becomes permanent. And we are then handicapped for the rest of our lives. So... I want to help find those things that are doing that this morning, those things that keep us from our potential in Jesus, and 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 those things that make us lame in our faith in Jesus Christ. See, if if you think about when Jesus was here, and you know this already, most of you do at least, but if you if you study through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus' message repeatedly to everybody around him was what? I mean, it was numerous things, but one of the things was like, you got to be willing to leave and follow. 
you got to be willing to forsake and follow. Repeatedly, he would have this message. And I believe that sometimes there's all kinds of things holding us back, but I really believe, I look at my life, and some of you know me really well, so you're going to be like, yes, Steve, you should preach to yourself. You're right, I should, and I am. But I look at my life, and sometimes the biggest thing holding us back, Matter of fact, I would argue in most of our lives, maybe all of our lives, the biggest thing holding us back from being all in with Jesus and going the whole way and doing crazy things and being his hands and feet in crazy ways is one person. That's called ourselves. I believe I have that up here. I believe the biggest threat to Jesus using us in a crazy, outlandish, changing the community, impacting people around us, changing the world. I believe the biggest threat to that potential is ourselves. Thank you. So, the problem is, many of us try to run, right? Many of us, many of us feel like, like maybe we're pulled pull back or we feel sort of a... In a box. How many of you have ever felt in a box? A few of you are listening and the rest of you aren't sure. You sort of feel like clamped in, right? You feel like you're not getting your potential or maybe there's issues or there's conflict. And the problem with a lot of us is we try to move. Maybe not geographically necessarily, but maybe we change schools or we move locations or we change jobs or we change churches. That's a pretty common one. And we do all these things because we feel like it would be different in the new arena. But guess what? Here's the problem. We take ourselves with us. And if the biggest threat to where Jesus wants you to go is yourself, moving locations isn't going to help a little bit. So we got to figure out what to do with ourselves. Open your Bibles to James. Actually, I have it on overhead as well. But you still can open your Bibles to James. In the beginning of chapter 4, see, I believe that um, I believe that ourselves being the problem of where Jesus wants to take us, I believe the biggest part of ourselves that interrupt God's ultimate potential and place we should go, destination for us, is our planning and our initiatives and our intentional strategy. So here we go, James. James chapter 4, in the beginning of, of chapter 4, uh, James challenges us. Uh, by the way, I love the book of James. Like, anyway, I know I've said that before. But, but in the beginning of this chapter, he challenges us to get our motives right. You know, he, he says, uh, I believe it's in verse uh, 5, where he talks about uh, of getting our motives straight and getting it right. The, the way beginning, he says, you quarrel and fight, like quit fighting, for crying out loud. You know, like, get along. And, and then if you go on down, uh, he, he talks about not tearing each other down, building each other up. Well, I would preach. We could park on that for a while. But if you go on, that's not the text. So the text is in verse 13. 13 through 17. James chapter 4. Here we go. Now listen, coming from James. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. We'll spend a year there. We'll carry on business and we'll make money. Listen, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then poof, vanishes. Instead, James says, instead you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this and that. As it is, you boast and you brag. All such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Now, here's the context. Uh, James was speaking to believers, believers in the church, believers in Jesus Christ that were part of the church. James was speaking to these guys that were businessmen. And these businessmen were doing a pretty good job of it. They were pushing and they were taking control of their own destiny, right? I mean, they were doing doing business. They were making things happen. We call them, uh, what do we call We call them movers and shakers, right? The guys who are aggressive and like, we're going to make something happen and we're going to build great things and we're going to, it's not all bad. You can be a believer in Jesus and, and do that kind of business and be a mover and a shaker. So that, that wasn't the bad thing that James was talking about. But here's what they were doing. They made all these kinds of strategies and these kinds of plans, 
and, and, and said, this is what we're going to do, and this is our goal, and next year we're doing this, and here's our five-year plan, here's our 10-year strategy, and here's our 20, 50-year retirement plan, and that's where we're going, and we're excited. Now, again, that, that's not all wrong. But the problem is they weren't coming into the equation of saying, well, what if that's really what God wants for me? Like, is, what if that doesn't align itself with the destiny that God has for me? See, I believe that's when it becomes wrong. When we have all these strategies and ideas and, and, and moves and counter moves and we, we know exactly where we want to go. And, and that's where we're going and we forget to equate that maybe God has a different plan. And, and we don't take into account that God's plan might look differently. And our agenda, see, I believe, I believe our agenda is one of the biggest hindrances to what God wants to do. How or what? Well, here we go. So most of us, mo- most of us when we plan, I want you to think about this. When you plan a strategy, when you plan, you know, what you want to start your career of or go to college for or, what, or, or maybe start a job or whatever it is, or, or when all of us plan for next year, you know, I'm, I'm sort of big on planning a next year, so often like this time of the year I start thinking strategy for 2020 and like, God, where would you have you go? And I try to say, God, where would you have us go? But sometimes we have all of this strategy and planning and intentional, you know, this is where we're going, and it is always around who? Somebody? It's always around me. Like, it, it, it is always about where I want to go, what I want to do. I think I have something on this, Andre, right? And, and all of a sudden, the main character of the story that I think should be written for next year is all about me, right? I mean, that's what we think about the most, is this character in the middle of this story. Why? Because it makes me feel safe. It builds me a safety net. It makes me feel secure. Now, some of you like to wing it from the hip, and you're okay with that. But some of us, we, we like to build things and strategize and have intentional goals and have an intentional structure. And again, that's not all bad. But we do it so that we feel safe. We feel organized. And, and we feel secure in the fact that there's my ship hanging out in the bay. That just in case where Jesus asked me to walk out on water, I can go back to my structure and my plan and what my dream was intact. So we keep that here attached to us just in case we need to fall back on that. Why is that? Well, because it puts me in control. You know, it's like I'm in charge at that point. Now the control freaks among us, you know, a couple fingers going back, um, but, but, We really have some of this. And again, I I don't want to knock down building and making plans and having agendas, but I believe when we strategize and we get organized to the fact that now we know where everything is and we're very comfortable with the process and it makes us feel very safe. Why? Because when I don't have a plan, I feel very uncomfortable. Uh, Marcus, can I point you out? So I have this saying back in my office that he really likes. A couple years ago, you told me that anyway. Now, this thing back there on a little card that says, when I get comfortable with being uncomfortable, God can finally use me. But see, when we have this safe strategy and plan that we have all worked out and it's all organized, getting outside of that makes us very uncomfortable. And our schedules, our initiatives, our strategies that we build that surround us make us feel really good. Jesus has a mission for us, and he has this crazy path to give him honor and him glory. But so often we're not willing to go there because we have a plan that we're attached to. And the agenda that, we go, that, that we'd have to go outside of that makes us feel very uncomfortable. Now, if we don't turn back to that ship, that ship of safety, that ship of control, that ship of where I have everything together... It takes us in a zone where we don't want to be. But my question is, and here's where I'm going, what is that within us? And I think all of us, again, whether you're a control freak or not, pardon me, but that's sort of a label. I think all of us have part of this within us that like to plan and control 
and have my own destiny to where I want to go, right? We, we want to feel comfortable about where I know I want to end up. And I'm wondering this morning, what drives that? What, what makes me very comfortable when I'm in control? What makes me very safe? What drives me to be secure in the ship parked on the bay that gives me security and my own plan? What is the biggest thing that is driving that? Now, granted, you know, some of the craziest control freaks, again, a label, might be born that way. But I think there's specific things that drive us to walk in that kind of environment. Number one, I believe the biggest thing, one of the biggest things that drives us to rest back in this safe ship of control and our own organization and our own intentional strategy is scars from the past. See, um, there's something behind us that has created this need to control our future. And the hurt and the pain that we walk through has taught us a lesson. And it's now trained me. You know, you know the saying, right? Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And we live by that. So, so if you hurt me before, I better well be very intentional that I'm guarded and don't let you hurt me again. So this scar back there in my past makes me very stand secure in my strategy and my organization and my safety net because I'm not going to let that happen again. Like I trusted him one time, I will not trust him again. I mean, I thought he was my friend. Like I'm not going to ever let that happen again. I'm not going to ever get close to anyone again. These are feelings we have. I mean... I'm going to create my own plan, my own safe ship that I can go back to. Because when I walk outside of that, now I feel uncomfortable and I remember how I got hurt. And that's a scar. And it's going to drive me to live within my own planning. And, 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 and I, I'm scared to create, to, to allow myself to fall in anyone's plans. I, I, by all means, don't trust any leaders around me because why? They burned me. And they violated things that were precious to me. So now my plan is my own plan. And you know, I I trusted my parents. And they failed me. I mean, I used to rely on people around me, like friend groups and people close to me. But they let me down. And I know I can't depend on people. I mean, I used to trust in God. And I wouldn't say this out loud, but, you know, he didn't answer me when I needed him. And so now, like I know, I have to take control and and do my own planning. Because when I needed people the most, when I needed God the most, I thought I was awash ashore. So now I'm going to keep my ship. And from now on, I'm making my own plans. And I'm going to stay in this safe agenda, this safe control that I have and and, and I'm, I'm going to keep this ship there so that, that if the unknown frontier where I'm going creates a problem, I can sort of withdraw back into that. I can keep that string attached, and that's my control, my safety net. That's the ship we need to burn. Second thing that makes me do my own plan. And it gives me confidence that my strategy is the best. Second thing is just straight up. Arrogance and ego. Now, I know most of you don't have that, but I'm speaking to myself. Lack of humility. I know best. I'm, I'm going to rest in my confidence. You know, the, the problem is when we live in our own control world and we make our own destiny, then, then we live in a world, again, that thinks only of myself. And, and the person that I have the most confidence in is me. I rely on myself. And there's only one person that hasn't let me down, and that's who? Me. Because if I have, I have a, uh, you know, I can sort of make excuses for it. So we're so full of ourselves, or maybe even not in our overconfidence, but in our underconfidence. See, there's this weird kind of feeling that we think we're humble if we're not confident in ourselves, which is very incorrect. Matter of fact, I would tell you that feelings of inferiority 
and underconfidence are one of the biggest symptoms of pride. Because you are now so worried of what others are thinking of you, you are consumed with the fact of how you look to others. And so now you plan your life totally so that you may impress others. And so this plan, this safety ship, this control I run, this whole thing that makes me feel comfortable, it's based on my arrogance and ego because I want to look good. And I don't want to look confused. And when somebody tells me I'm unorganized, that, that really hurts my ego. Because I don't want to be that kind of person. Now there's a problem with that. A number of problems, but one, James talks about earlier, and we didn't read this. But earlier in the chapter, verse 6, here's what James says. He, speaking of God, gives us more grace. And that's why scripture says, God what? Doesn't really care for the proud. God what? What's the word? Somebody? Tyler, what's the word? No, 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 this one. God opposes. Well, like, so God, like, intentionally goes against. So, like, when I'm arrogant... When I'm egotistic, when I have my safety net where I can crawl back in my control and run the show, when I can fall back in my world where I'm organized and I'm strategizing and I'm planning, God doesn't only like not like that. He actively opposes. Maybe this is why God, it feels like God is against us. Sometimes. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So I believe one of the driving factors that makes us want to live in our own controlled environment, one of the driving factors that wants that safe ship at bay where we feel organized and structured and controlled, may be arrogance. Third reason that I believe we drive towards being in a controlled environment of our own and we drive towards having our own agenda is maybe possibly just straight up our own carnal appetite. Now, there's a lot of places we could go with this. Uh, We're all born with this carnality, right, with this nature within us that wants things that are not godly, this desires that want to be filled that are far from Christ. It's called our carnal nature. Galatians chapter 5 actually speaks about this. I think I have this up here. Galatians chapter 5. Uh, Paul talks about this. Here's what he says. Verse 16 through 21. He says, I live by, he says, so I say, live by the spirit and you won't gratify the desires of the sinful nature or the carnal desires. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit. The spirit, what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other. In other words, you can't have both. Think about that. You can't have both. They're in conflict with each other. So that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now listen up, here it is. Verse 19. The acts of the sinful nature or the carnal desires are obvious. He gives a whole list of them. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry. Which, by the way, could be worship of ourselves. Witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. None of us have that. Dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I believe our own carnal desires, our own wantonness, the things we're born with could possibly drive us to want us to live in our own controlled world. Where we're organizing. We're laying out the strategy. Now, we're, next Sunday is the plan. We're going to talk more about burning the string or burning the ships of the attached strings to the bad habits and the sinful actions in our lives. So I'm going to let that for next Sunday. But my point here this morning is the appetite, our appetite, our carnal appetite, what, what we want outside of Jesus And what is all about, you know, fleshly desires, I believe that that could be a driver that creates you to want to be in your own controlled environment. I don't know if you ever looked at it that way before. Maybe you just thought you were a control freak. But if you want to be in control, it could very possibly be that you have this carnal desire 
that needs to be filled. You know, I remember this guy named Samson. You remember him in the Old Testament? Judges chapter, uh, I think, 14 through 16. Incredible story of Samson. I, mean, I won't make you raise your hand. But read the story of Samson. Judges chapter 14 through 16. It's incredible. Samson is this very gifted man. Like he is a strong leader. Like actually physically strong too. But, but he, he's a very solid, like th- this guy God wants to use. But repeatedly, repeatedly he falls into his carnal appetite. And again, God like tries to use him again. He's gifted. He's, he's talented. He's strong. Now, there's maybe a few of you as buff as Samson was, but aside from that, there's some of you that are very gifted this morning. There's some of you that are very talented. God gave you intense, incredible gifts. But what holds us back and what drives us into our own controlled world is exactly what drove Samson. Our carnal appetite. Now, we don't want to give up these little habits. We'll talk about that next Sunday. But I believe that can drive us to live in our own controlled world. Number four. This could be a big one. It could very possibly be. If you want to live in a controlled environment and if you want your ship at bay that you can rest back into, that you can be controlled in your strategy and your intentional calendar and organization, it could be very possible that you are simply ignorant of God's personality. So maybe we just have a lack of teaching. Or maybe we just have a lack of learning. But I believe, including myself, I quite often show my ignorance of God's personality, because let me tell you a little bit something about God. See, I don't, I don't think we understand God. I, I don't think I understand his omnipotence, and by the way, that means all power. I don't think I understand how omnipotent and powerful and in control he is. I don't think I understand his generosity. I don't think I understand his love. I don't think I understand his grace. See, this This God, this creator of the universe, this God that has no beginning and no end, he has a personality that we should know about. Because this God is, is, while he's beyond all their power, we know this, but we know it intellectually. I don't know if we know it in here. This God has sent part of himself to be a man. To pay the price for you. And he showed his love in a huge sacrifice. Why? Because he's crazy about you. And he loves you. And his heart is with you. And, and, and if you understand that, I believe if we would really understand who God is and understand his personality, all of a sudden, I would be okay with not being in control. All of a sudden... This strategy and intentional organization that makes me feel safe, I would be okay with giving that up because I know God is love and I know he's generous and I know he pours out grace and I know he does crazy things and I know he's more powerful than my schedule and strategy could ever be. But I don't think we know that. At least we don't act like it. I believe maybe quite possibly this could be the number one reason that you and I aren't willing to give up control, is that we're ignorant of God's personality. You know, Paul says, uh, Paul says to know him and the power of his resurrection. We could talk about that for a while. You know, that was part of God, his son Jesus, who overcame death. Right? None of us can overcome death. We can't even get close So, I'm just backtracking a little bit. If I want to quit being ignorant of God's personality, how do I change that? It's pretty easy. Spend time with God. Right here is where you find all about God. Get into his word. Talk to him. Like dig. Like seek the face of Jesus. Because when I was studying this this week, it just hit me. It hit me like a ton of bricks. I truly believe I am ignorant of some of the personalities of God. And if I am, it's no one's fault but my own. And spending time to crying out to God, like, God, I just want to know you. Like, God, show me. Remember Moses? 
have this incredible story with Moses when, when, when the children of Israel worshipped the golden calf and they were going crazy and, and then God wanted to kill them. And then Moses says, like, no, God, I know your personality and I know that you're full of grace. And God, I want you to shower on all these people. And then this is what he says. You've got to read it. I think it's in Genesis chapter or Exodus chapter 15, I think. And, and then Moses says to God, he's like, man, just show me your ways, God. Like, show me who you are. Maybe that would help us understand his personality. And we would be willing to give up control. And we would be willing to cut the tie with that security and safety that we've created. Last but not least. Fifth reason we don't trust God to make a plan. That we initiate and, and, and stay in our own control. Here's the driver for that is it's just a straight up lack of faith. Now, I know we've been talking about this a lot, but we're going to keep talking about it. See, I believe uh, we, there's, there's a theme verse we've been looking at for this, right? Remember the theme verse with this whole series? Hebrews chapter 12, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verse 37, verse 38. For in just a little while, he, God, who's coming, will come and will not delay. And look what he says. And, and but my righteous one, wait, 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 yeah, and was the last one. But my righteous one will live by faith. And, it take, and he takes, and I, I'm sorry, God speaking, I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. So very possibly, one of the drivers in your life that makes you want to live in your own controlled world is just simply a lack of faith. I think the great stress we put in planning and in making our agenda and controlling the things that happen to us, I, I want to be, I so badly want to be in control. I want to control what people do to me, and I want to control what happens around me, and I want to control my environment, and I want to live in in my structure, in my organization. And we excuse ourselves. Listen, now, very possibly this could just simply be a lack of faith. But the the problem is we we excuse ourselves, and, um, you know, we sort of laugh about it. You know, I'm a little bit of a control freak. Or or we... um, we say, I don't, I don't trust others to make my future. You know, I take my own destiny in my hands. I think that's a good thing. We, we say we trust Jesus. We, tr- we say we trust this all-powerful God, and yet we have our ship with plans to fall back on and our agenda. And, and the problem is th- we keep that ship there sitting in the bay that we very easily swim back to. And whenever times get hard or rough, that's where we go. And, and, and I believe, here's what I believe. I believe this concept of falling back into our control is directly against the passion of God. I believe if we understand the personality of God, you know, we say we understand what he taught. And we, we, we know that, you know, I believe that Jesus died on the cross to take all of our sins. Can I hear an amen to that? Every wrong thing you have ever done and ever will do, Jesus paid the price for. I believe that with all my heart. He paid the pardon. You are free. This is why he died, to take the punishment that you deserve. He took the life of a criminal so that you wouldn't have to, even though you deserve it. But if you read what Jesus taught, I very much believe there's one thing that will keep you out of eternal life. There's one thing that has to happen or you're just simply not going to make it. And that is, you got to live by faith. I mean, Jesus says over and over again in the Gospels, how are you going to live? How how are you going to have eternal life? By believing. By believing, by, by resting. See, see, Jesus took the punishment for everything else. He paid the price. But, but I believe the absence of faith. I really believe the absence of faith. This idea of walking in my own control. I believe this will bar us from the kingdom of God. Because Jesus teaches so clearly you have to believe. I believe um, all of these drivers that urge us to live in a controlled world that we make, all of these things that 
drive us to have that safety net attached. All of these reasons and motives that, that create or that, that stir within us to control our own destiny. I believe in my life, I've been studying these. And I believe they're a lot deeper than what you can dig out in one Sunday morning. I believe these drivers I see in my life that stir this, the, you know, the lack of faith and the wanting to live in my own controlled world and that make a control freak out of me or whatever all of that is. I believe they're a lot deeper than what I can dig out easily. Because our, our cultural mentality has been ingrained so deep in our lives. And, and it's very difficult to change. But here's what I'm begging you to consider this morning. This straight up. The first step to recovery is seeing that there's a problem. The first step to change is seeing that there's a need. So if I look at why I want to be in this controlled safety net of my own thinking, if I look why I'm trusting in my own strategy, in my own organization, if I look why I'm going there, the, the first point of changing is admitting there's a problem. I believe that until we see this control mentality for what it is, a lack of faith, and for all these other drivers, that make, until we see that being a problem, it will never change. But if God opens our eyes and we allow him to change brick by brick, I'll we will become different people. We'll start living by faith. And we won't need to be in control. We won't need to be attached to these good, safe harnesses that we feel good about. Would you all stand with me? I would ask you that you make this, you make this a constant prayer. Jesus, help me to live in a world where I don't feel in control. That's hard. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray this morning. Help us to give up control. God, you, you know that so many of us, maybe possibly all of us, at some rate or another, we, we, we want to be in control of our lives. And we feel like we can keep it together. And we, we pray for wisdom to do that. But we don't just rely on you. And we keep this ship at safe bay that we can sort of back into of our own structure, our own intention, our own goals, our own dreams, whatever that is. Instead of just saying, Jesus, we're going to trust you. We're going to rely on you. We're going to get rid of all those, those carnal desires that pull us back into our control. We're, God, we want to know you. We want to know your personality. And Jesus, we're going to ask you to, to bring healing to the scars, the pain and the hurt, and, and help us to, to trust again. God, would you, would you stir this in our hearts? Lead us into your glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.